This is the place. Stand still, my steed. Let me review the scene and summon from the shadowy past the forms that once have been. The past and present here unite beneath time's flowing tide, like footprints hidden by a brook, but seen on either side. Welcome. I'm the gatekeeper of the Washington Cemetery. This burial ground was established in 1842 as the final resting place for hundreds of Washington, Connecticut residents over the past two centuries. This time of year, we honor those who have passed. During Halloween, the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest, and spirits return to Earth. Tonight, you will hear from the men and women of Washington's past, including suffragettes, bootleggers, and those who faced the flu pandemic of 1918. They have returned to tell us their stories, some amusing, some sad, and some tragic. Listen well to their lessons. You may now enter the cemetery. Please follow your tour guide and stay close to the light because you never know what might be lurking in the darkness. Nice to meet you all. I'm Abigail Brinsmaid, granddaughter of Frederick Gunn and Abigail Irene Brinsmaid, whom I was named after. I was born in 1896 here in Washington, Connecticut. From a young age, I knew I wanted to help people. Maybe I took after my grandfather, who is an educator, abolitionist, and founder of the gunnery. Did you hear it's now called the Frederick Gunn School? I'm so happy his name and legacy continue to live on. I myself attended the Wickham Rise School and graduated in 1913. Afterwards, I attended Vassar College to study nursing for four years. In the summer of 1917, me and my fellow classmate, Helen Carter, worked with the first Vassar farm unit called the Farmettes in Poughkeepsie during the Great War. We grew vegetables for the college. Once the summer was over, I went to Philadelphia to begin my training as a nurse at Chestnut Hill Hospital. I could never have predicted just how crucial we healthcare workers would become. Philadelphia was especially hard hit by the 1918 flu. Although public health officials warned everyone of the dangers of mass gatherings, editors of newspapers refused to print doctors' letters. Unsurprisingly, after a large-scale parade in late September, influenza spread rapidly. In just six weeks, over 12,000 people died in Philadelphia. While caring for the sick, I fell ill as well. I wanted so badly to keep helping others, but I couldn't fight the asthma and pneumonia caused by the flu. I died at age 22 in October of 1918. While I know my early death caused a lot of pain for my friends and family, I'm proud of what I accomplished. I want to read to you what my obituary says. While it is sad to see such a young life go out, yet the thought is impressed upon us at this time that a nurse who dies in the performance of her duty is as truly serving her country as the soldier who dies on the battlefield. You'll be meeting my mom, Mary Brinsmaid, up ahead, and I just want her to know that I'm proud of the time I spent as a nurse and I wouldn't change anything. Good evening. I'm Mary Gunn Brinsmaid, daughter of Frederick Gunn and Abigail Brinsmaid. I was born in Washington in 1853. Growing up, I attended the gunnery school, which was founded by my father, who was an abolitionist, an educator, and an outdoorsman. It is no wonder to anyone that I developed a few progressive beliefs of my own. Well, thanks to him, I learned the importance of advocating for something you truly believed in. That something for me was women's suffrage. Women's suffrage was the movement to gain women the right to vote. I gave my voice as best I could, and I wrote letters to the newspaper. I would like to read excerpts from a letter that I wrote that was published in the Hartford Current in July of 1920. As a Republican woman of Connecticut, whose father was, whose husband is a Republican, I wish to express my feeling at this time. In what have we women failed? 
Have we not loyally given our time and labors unceasing, our voice and whatever of influence we have, our money and our very heart's blood for our country? Is it possible that the men of Connecticut are afraid that the votes of such self-sacrificing women will endanger our beloved country? 29 Republican states have voted for women's suffrage by national action. The Republican National Committee, with practical unanimity, has recommended that Republican states should ratify in time for women to vote this year. Now is the one and only opportunity for the men of Connecticut to thus honor their women. Shall they go down to posterity as having put this slight upon their women? Shall their children confess with shame that their mother's faithful, loyal service was thus disregarded? Are the men of Connecticut willing that when many million women of our country have the ballot already, the women of Connecticut shall be denied? The 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote was officially ratified a month later on August 18, 1920. The, the relief, the pride, the excitement, all the assortment of feelings that greeted me as the efforts of a decades-long movement came to fruition washed over me. I am grateful that all the women who have come after me are able to exercise this right as citizens of the United States. Good evening, everybody. My name's William McKay, but you can call me Bill. Some of you may even may have heard rumors about me. Well, sit back, get yourselves a real drink, and I'm gonna tell you the story about my life during Prohibition here in New Preston. I was born in 1886 in Vermont, but spent most of my life in Connecticut. During World War I, I worked in New Haven for the Winchester Arms Company as a machinist. Shortly after the war, I moved up to Bristol and worked for ND Manufacturing. It was there I met my wife-to-be, Gracie. We were married shortly afterwards and we moved up to New Preston. Now that all the joy stuff's out of the way, stuff you could read about in the census, I'm gonna tell you what you want to hear. I owned and operated one of the six speakeasies in New Preston during Prohibition. My place was called the Cedar Lodge. It was down on Lake Warramog where the Washington town beach is today. And boy, were we ever popular. In the evenings, we'd have dining and dancing. We were particularly popular with them summer residents. I think they liked the fact that we were right there on the beach. Although some of them liked to drop of my liquor too. Because it was prohibition, we had to hide it, you see. You never guess where we hid it. Some of it was up in the storm drain on Flirtation Avenue. Some more we put up behind the rocks up there at Henry Beeman's fish hatchery. And the last lot we put in burlap sacks and hung it beneath old man Beeman's dock. All with his permission, of course. I had to grease the wheel now and again. You may say I was in a good place. Well, I was, and I was confident. I'd built up my wealth and my reputation. I even had six houses hereabouts and stock in the bank. That newspaper, uh, the Herald, even called me out on it like there was something to be surprised about. They said, down at my lodge, the Cedar Lodge, they said, liquor flowed like water. <laughs> and that couples let loose doing scandalous things and making disturbing noises. Sounds to me like that reporter that wrote the article. He was just bitter about missing out on all the fun. <laughs> me, I died three decades after Prohibition ended in 1967 with zero regrets. Take a page out of my book, live your life to the fullest, and be cautious of those that want to tear you down. Good evening. My name is Deaconess Mabel Holbart, and I am here to tell you about my time working at the Holiday House here in Washington. The Holiday House operated from 1893 until 1918. It was funded by Edward Hook Van Ingen, a wealthy wool merchant, and designed by Eric Rossiter. The house was a place of respite for working class girls from New York City. Being from the city myself, born in Brooklyn in 1877, I had a soft spot for these hard working girls. In order to be a summer resident of the house, 
the girls had to be unmarried. They were also members of the girls club of the St. Bartholomew Episcopal Church in Manhattan. My role was assistant to Deaconess Ella Taylor. Being a graduate of the New York Training School for Deaconesses, I was prepared for the job. I also held several positions in New York City, including being in charge of the Sunday School Primary Department of the Church of the Incarnation. The purpose of the Holiday House, in Ms. Taylor's words, was to develop the home life to its highest ideal. We wanted the girls to nurture good morals and manners, but we also made sure that they enjoyed their vacation with us. Their days were filled with an assortment of activities like croquet, bowling, archery, baseball, or just a calm time reading and crocheting. During the evenings, we hosted games, dances, short plays, or tableau in the ballroom. There were no outside guests, however, and everyone retired by 10 p.m. And if any of our girls was ever found with a boy from town, she'd be sent on the next train home. Essential to the girls' experience were scheduled picnics and walks at Lake Warmog and the Clamshell in Steep Rock Preserve. It was so easy to fall in love with the beautiful natural scenery of Washington. After World War I, the Van Ingens could no longer afford the upkeep of the Holiday House and closed its doors. The girls who worked in the sweatshops would no longer have a chance to get away from their long hours of labor with no laws to guarantee their safety. When the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, I hoped that giving women the right to vote would allow these hard-working girls a voice to be able to improve their working conditions. I decided to retire here in 1938 and built a house up on the green. Though I never had children or a husband, I lived with a dear friend of mine, Maria Heckman. She too was from Brooklyn and had been a music teacher and president of the Episcopal Diocese of Long Island. Maria and I, along with the Holiday House, show just how far back the ties are between Washington, Connecticut and New York City. Hello everyone, my name is Annabelle Halleck and I'm afraid the story of me and my family is quite the tragic one. I was born in 1900 in Washington, Connecticut. My family owned Halleck Orchards on Calhoun Street. I have the fondest of memories of fresh apples in the fall. Customers would come and pick their own and we would pick some to sell in bags. In the summer of 1908, we were planning another fun and productive fall until the first tragedy befell us. When my older brother Raymond was out working in the hayfield, a terrible thunderstorm began. So he came inside and sat by an open window. All of a sudden, a flash of lightning struck and the whole room filled with smoke. When the smoke cleared, mother noticed that Raymond was unconscious. He had been killed. My brother was only 17 years old at the time. Things were never the same, but we had to continue on. Only 10 short years later, the Spanish flu, or what you call the 1918 flu pandemic, came to Connecticut. I remember reading in the newspaper about the first outbreak in New London. Churches, schools, and public gatherings like fairs, football games, and performances were being canceled all over the state. Pretty soon, New Britain, Hartford, and Waterbury all saw cases, and then we did too. I started feeling unwell in November. I had influenza for five days and pneumonia for two before passing away on November 17th. I was only 18 years old. I wonder if there's some sort of curse put on my family for both me and my brother passed away at around the same age. And oh, my poor father. I heard he afterwards went to the state psychiatric hospital in Newtown. One can only imagine the emotional toll of losing your children. Remember my words and stay safe, everyone. How do you do? My name is Elizabeth Whittlesey, though you can call me Lizzie. And I was born in Washington, Connecticut in 1862. When I grew up, I became a school teacher. So keeping it in the spirit of those times, I'd like to give you a lesson about the pandemic of 1918. The Spanish flu, as it became known, actually started in Haskell County in Kansas in January of 1918. 
Several men from Haskell went to Camp Funston, a large army base in Kansas. And within months, thousands of soldiers had reported sick with the flu. Oh, and from there, the, the virus spread like wildfire as soldiers traveled between bases and went overseas. Although it started in the US, it was called the Spanish flu because Spain was one of the few countries that reported about it in the press. At the time, many other countries were involved in the Great War and censored news about the flu because they wanted to keep up morale. Also, many of those countries, including the United States, thought the Spanish flu was a, a mild affliction and no great cause for concern. Oh, however, the second wave proved to be most deadly, the likes of which we'd never seen before. The second wave of the flu began in the fall of 1918. In October alone, over 195,000 people across the country died, including 5,000 in Connecticut. And oh, what frightened us all the most was that nobody seemed safe. Even young, healthy people were dying. At the time, my sister Mary and I were orders at the Connecticut State Institute for the Insane. I know what you're thinking. You're imagining an overcrowded and unsanitary place with, with violent and cruel practices, but no. The state hospital was a moral place. It, it focused on healing rather than, than punishing people with mental illness. Oh. It was built in the 1860s on beautiful farmland in Middletown, Connecticut. And it focused on, on all kinds of activities, both inside and outside in nature. Even so, being ill in a, in a mental institution, oh, I became ill with the flu and I died on November the 13th, 1918. I was 56. I was happy to have my sister with me at least. Oh, and I have such fond memories of my time here in Washington, including playing the organ at Woodville Church in the early 1900s. Those and happier memories remain with me in the afterlife. Take care, one and all. Hello, folks. My name is Sylvester Cook. I know, I know, prohibition is long gone. So let me ease up tonight and, and tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Colebrook, Connecticut in 1905. I don't remember my dad much. He, he just run off somewhere and he left us all behind. My mother, well, she sent me to the Gilbert School when she no longer could afford to keep up the family. <laughs> When I grew older, I worked as a stonemason in New Preston, Connecticut. Matter of fact, I, I met my first wife, Margaret, while I was working on the job. Well, we had five kids. And I wonder now if my firstborn remembers when I used to hide my liquor bottles under the baby's cribs. Well, well you see, back then I, I was also working in the business of being a bootlegger, uh, you know, Prohibition, the time when the government outlawed the manufacture and sale of alcohol. Well, I worked as a moonshiner and I supplied all the speakeasies in town. Matter of fact, uh, you just heard from one of my buyers up ahead, uh, a Mr. McKay. <laughs> well, now, I, I used to make my liquor in the morning and sell it to him in the afternoon. Well, they, they said I made some pretty powerful poison, and, and the people that drank my liquor, oh, well, they became insanely drunk. Oh, oh, um, I, I have to be careful. There are spies all around, and matter of fact, there, were, there was a watch point down by Judge Bridges' barn next to Cogwell's Tavern on Christian Street. They even had a direct sight line down to my place on Schwab Road. Someone even put dynamite under my car. But I discovered it before it set off. And, and, and thank goodness for those bootleggers in town. Well, they would warn me when their places got raided so I 
I had time to prepare. Now, now Prohibition ended in 1933, and somehow I made it through in one piece. <laughs> well, well, eventually I, I just packed up all my things and, and headed up to Boston on my own. I, uh, I guess I became a little bit more like my father now, didn't I? Well, after a while, I, I started a new family and uh, ended up working in construction in the South End. Oh, now I remember. I remember my final brush with death in 1961. Well, well, I was just coming out of a cafe when I got assaulted by three teenagers. Well, I, I got a bad, bad brain injury and, and eventually I, I died at home at age 56. Well, I, I suppose the, the moral of the story is don't take your time here for granted. Not if you're a risk taker like me. Gutkeval, my name is Hilma Swanberg. The long version is Hilma Josefina Janssen Carlsen Swanberg. I was born in 1879 in Sweden and came to America for its great opportunities. Oh, I had such large family. I was blessed with two beautiful daughters from my first marriage with Charles Carlson, and then I married Jan Swanberg, also from Sweden, who had six children of his own. His youngest child, just a year old, was sent back to Sweden to be raised by her grandparents. So when our families combined, we had a total of seven children, plus Harris Jan Swanberg, later born to me and Jan. Jan emigrated to America in 1893 and first settled in Worcester, Massachusetts before he came here to Washington in 1896 to start business as blacksmith. His first wife, Albertina, oh, such terrible tragedy. She died when her apron caught fire when kerosene stove exploded. Oh, I never wished that sort of pain on my dear Jan ever again, but unfortunately, I passed away in November of 1918 at the age of 39 from the Spanish flu. Thankfully, Jan still had all his children to get him through and the Swanberg name lived on. Our son Harris was well known around Washington, I hear. He was known to town folk as Swanee and said he had heart of gold, which makes me so happy. Uh, he was a town fire chief and town treasurer in 1960s and he also had his own business. It was called Harry's Village Market on corner of Titus Road and Beebrook Road before he sold it and then he took over a running Washington liquor store. In 1955 when the flood came, I'm sure he was front and center helping with the rescue efforts and clean up in the aftermath. My husband Jan, he lived a long time after me and died in 1957. And though I wish I got to live a little bit longer, I'm so happy our descendants are doing well and still have strong connection to Washington. Well, I wish to tell you all how you say in American, uh, be healthy, or as we say in Swedish, hola sigfrisk. Hello, my name is Frances Hitchcock. I was born here in Litchfield, the next town over, in 1864. But I spent a lot of my time here in Washington at my family's ancestral home that is over on Calhoun Street. I spent so much time here that the gunnery asked me to be the piano teacher for quite a while. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my remarkable parents who are also here with me, Mary Catherine Brisbane and George Augustus Hitchcock, who were both very early supporters of women's suffrage, very early supporters. My dad, who was a lawyer and a judge, actually became a member of the Connecticut State Legislature in 1862. And eventually, he became editor of the Litchfield Inquirer, which he was at the helm for 25 years, starting in 1866. He wrote quite a bit about women's rights, including even publishing a pamphlet called The Legal Disabilities of Married Women. Because you see, when women married, they lost 
guardianship of their children, they lost their property rights, and they lost their ability to collect even their own wages. My father, of course, took a great deal of ridicule for supporting women's rights, but he was adamant. And he really felt that when women got the right to vote, that they would clean up the political corrupt climate and purify the vote. I was an educator, and I ended up being principal of the Litchfield School for Girls, and I also was an adamant suffragist. I worked with the Washington Club here in Washington, Connecticut, and I also worked with the Equal Franchise League in Litchfield, where I was president. The Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association was very active here in our area, and a Mrs. Taylor and I began organizing a march in Hartford, Connecticut at the Bushnell Park in 1914. We garnered over 2,000 people asking for the passage of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. World War I, or it was called the Great War then, broke out in 1917, and I, like a lot of women, wanted to serve our country. I went to France in 1917, and I was there till 1919. Unfortunately, when I came home after working with the men there and working on food and medical relief and writing letters home to their families when these soldiers died, unfortunately, we still here in America did not want to give women the right to vote. Finally, in August 1920, women were seeing the state of Tennessee give women the right to vote, which was finally ratified by the whole United States in September 1920. I worked my life for suffrage and for the cause of the vote. Millions of women and men also worked trying to get Americans, all Americans, the right to vote. It is now encased in our Constitution. I urge you to vote. Your vote matters. Thank you.